Praise God, it's such a privilege to be here this morning. And Mr. God's Word, I want to thank uh, Pastor Colton, Pastor Deshaun, and all the pastors for having me today. I am back home today. It's good to be back home, isn't it? You know, uh, I love this church. I was saved actually 37 years ago, Ducky. 37 years ago on Christmas Day in 1981 at 11.30 in the morning. I'll never forget the time. Pastor Colton was preaching. He was preaching on the three wise men that were asked by the, by, by the Lord to go another way. And you know what? The Lord spoke to me. I distinctly, clearly heard his voice. And his voice said to me, are you prepared to go another way? It was a deep voice of God. And that was the first time I heard the audible voice of God in my life. And I probably seated on the same types of chairs, I think about three rows behind with my darling wife. And uh, God came into my heart. And it's been 37 years now and I never looked back. Amen. 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 That was the greatest day in my life. The greatest day. As you know, I was a national rugby football player, captain Sri Lanka in 78. And you know, I was very much involved in all sorts of uh, you know, drinking, boozing, partying, and you name it. But God always had his hand upon my life. And uh, I loved God, but I didn't know him. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. But God had his grace and his hand upon my life. That, you know, in his time, he brought me to the right church, to the right place. And he touched my heart. And I've never been the same again. I'm married to a beautiful woman. Her name is Ingrid. We are married 40 years. And we have six children. Five are married, five are girls, and one is a boy. The boy is still a bachelor at home. And we have got three beautiful grandchildren. So we are so blessed. And uh, God has taken us on a marvelous journey. And we are so thankful to God for his faithfulness, for his love, for, his, for all the provisions that he has made in our lives. And he has never, never been unfaithful. You know, I'm here to celebrate 70 years of Pastor Colton's ministry. And I got saved under his ministry and I honor him with all of my heart. And he's been a mentor. He's actually my pastor. And even though I'm in Australia, you know, we are, he's still my pastor. And I honor him. So I was definitely going to make it to be here on this special, you know, uh, celebration. And also the church. 60 years of this church. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? You see, you see God's hand upon the life of this church. As I always told myself, it's a solid church. We know well grounded in the word of God. Solid in the doctrines of, of, of God's word. And it's a church where we can all learn and grow and be safe. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you this morning that uh, God has a plan for your life. You know, while I was seated there, I just thought to myself, I felt the Lord say this to me, you know. I felt the Lord say, you know, you're going into another level. You know, I believe that we go from one level to another level, don't we? We don't stay where we are. And I don't believe that this church will ever stay the way it is. It's a church that God will bless and continue to bless and continue to work upon the life of the people of this church. Uh, just a few uh, months ago, actually it was in August, on the 30th of August last year, the Lord spoke to me and said, you know, I couldn't believe that God could speak, me, speak to me from the book of Leviticus. It's chapter 26, verse 9. He said these words to me. He said, I'm going to look upon you with grace. I'm going to look upon you with favor, in other words. And while I was sitting at your celebrations last Sunday, and I just thought to myself, God has looked upon this church with favor. Amen. Favor of God is all that we need. And when the Lord spoke to me, I said, I'm going to look upon you with favor. It didn't mean that he had not put his favor upon us before. He had put his favor, but there was further favor coming upon the life of the church. And then he said to me, he said, I'm going to make you fruitful. I think we all need to be fruitful in life. God wants every church to be fruitful. God wants every individual to be fruitful. God wants every business to be fruitful. God wants every family to be fruitful. And that's, that's the desire and the heart of God, that he wants his people to be fruitful, and he will make us fruitful. If you're sitting there this morning and thinking, you know, uh, where is my life going? What's happening to my life? 
I want to encourage you this morning that God has only one plan for your life and that plan is to make you fruitful. Amen. In every area of your life, your ministry, wherever God has called you, he wants to make you fruitful. And fruitful will you be because God is a God of fruitfulness. Amen. And then the Lord said to me, I'm going to increase your numbers. And that's something that I've been believing God for a great, for a long time. And I believe, as you can see, the same thing has happened to the life of this church, where God has increased and increased and increased, and he will continue to increase. Because God is a God of increase, not decrease. He's a God of increase. Sometimes when we come to a retiring age, actually in the Bible, there is no such word called retirement. We don't retire. Pastor Calder will never retire. Why should we retire? Because God always has a work for us. Amen. So because he has a work for us, he's always in the business of increasing in our lives. And I've seen, I've been sharing this with our church and saying, church, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're still on earth, still breathing, God wants to increase your life. And we begin to see the church increase and grow. And God's doing something amazing. And in that same verse of scripture, it says that God will keep his covenant with you. You know, God is a covenant keeping God. Amen. He keeps his covenant, you know, to all generations. And I, you know, when I think of covenant, we always refer back to the Old Testament covenant where, you know, you keep your bargain, God keeps his bargain. And I understand that there is a, there is a level of obedience, faithfulness, change of lifestyle, etc. But one thing with God is, he's already made the covenant and we become the beneficiaries of this great covenant that God has made between the Father and between the Son and we become beneficiaries of the covenant that God has kept. So all that the Bible says, all that the word of God says, if we will only believe, if we bring ourselves to the obedience of God's word and make God's word final authority in our lives, the covenant of God will begin to work in your life and in my life. Amen. So with that in mind, with that, I begin to think and ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to say to the church? So God began to speak to me, which I want to share with you this morning. Uh, I've been speaking on the same subject in our church for the last six months, and I haven't been able to exhaust it. It's been such a massive, massive, you know, uh, series of sermons that I've been doing. So I'm going to do my best this morning to try and finish it within two hours or three hours. Is that okay? I promise you I'll finish before two o'clock. The next service at 2 (laughs) o'clock. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Turn with me to your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to verse 28. You're with me this morning? How many of you excited to be in the house of God? How many of you can believe in God to do something in your life? You know, I tell our church, when you come together, come believing. Because when you come expecting, God is a God who will meet that expectation of yours. Amen? Amen. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to verse 28, as you turn there. You know, uh, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, the Lord led me. I was an associate pastor of another church. I was serving with uh, Pastor Alan Davis, who was the uh, state president of the AOG. And I have served with him for 22 years of my life. And I was 53. And then the Lord told me to, uh, to step out and plant a church. I said, God, I'm too old to plant a church. But you know, you can't get into a conversation with God. When he says something to do, you've got to do it. So very, very happily after consulting my family, I stepped out and said, Lord, all right, I will plant the church. But I don't have the money, Lord. And then God said, I will provide for you. So we had a budget and God met every cent and every, he met it abundantly. And we planted our church in a, state called, in a, in a, in a city called Roville. If you know Melbourne, Australia, I'm sure some of you have been there. I'm in Roville. And we, and we planted Resto Community Church. After five years, the Lord led us to buy our own building. And God provided for us to be able to do that. And today we, are, we occupy or we have, we have our own building fully paid up by the Lord. And God has been truly, truly faithful where he has honored every step of faith of ours. I will never forget when I wanted to, when I found out that there was a church that was selling their chairs, not selling their chairs, giving their chairs away. So I went and said, I'll take the chairs. I took the chairs, I did it up, and I kept it in my garage. Five, four years before even I got a building. 
There was another church that was selling their, their, their soundboard. And I, I bought the soundboard and I left it in another believer's home because it was a huge board. I took steps of faith. Errol is here this morning. Errol is a very good friend of mine. He worships at Resto. He will tell you the story. And every step of faith that we took, God honored it. And God has given us amazing building that we occupy today. And we have our services. And God is doing an awesome job. An awesome work taking place in Resto Community Church. Amen. I think you should give the Lord a hand. Amen. Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 28. I think it will come up on the screen. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. And should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. You know, uh, as I said, that, as the Lord said that he was going to increase the numbers of our church, I begin to think, Lord, what do you want me to do with the church in regards to preparing them? And the Lord was beginning to tell me to change the culture of the church. Now, if you look at this verse of scripture, it tells us that the man should cast seed into the ground. Now, the ground is really you and me. The ground, the earth, the culture is you and me. See, the, there's nothing wrong with the seed. The seed of God is incorruptible. But the soil where the seed is sown is where the problem is. It is nothing to do with the word of God. If God is going to bring increase in your life, what you have to focus on is you, your ground, your soil. Is your soil, is the ground that you are, your, who you are, is it good soil? So the Bible tells us here, the earth brings forth fruit. Not the seed, the earth brings forth fruit. So it is you that will bring forth fruit in your life. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2 verses 42 verse, two, verse 47. My, my point is this, I looked at the church and I said to God, what sort of church do you want? What sort of church do I want? What sort of church do you want people's church to be? The pastors know what they want the church to be. Pastor Colton's vision is very clear. I still hold on to the vision that he has. But you have to get hold of the vision too. So what sort of church do you think people's church is? Acts 2, 42 to 47, the believers spent their time listening to the teachings of the apostles. They shared everything with each other. They ate together and they prayed together. Verse 43, many wonders and miraculous signs were happening through the apostles and everyone felt respect for God. All the believers stayed together and shared everything. They sold their land and the things they owned. Then they divided the money and gave it to those who needed it. I don't know how that will sit with you today. The believers shared a common purse. And every day they spent much of their time together in the temple area. They also ate together in their homes. They were happy to share their food and ate with joyful hearts. Verse 47. The believers praised God. And were respected by all the people. More and more people were being saved every day. And the Lord was adding them to their group. My question this morning is, can we be an Acts 2, 42 to 47 church again? That's my question this morning. Can we be? I'm not talking about only people's church. I'm talking about the churches around the world, in this country, in my country, can we be an Acts 2, 42 to 47 church again? Can you see how the people of the book of Acts live their lives? I want to draw your, your attention this morning to six values that I have been sharing with our church for the past six and more months from this passage of scripture. The six values that we have is 
is we believe in community. Now that's something that's very important which I'll take some time to share with you. Another value that we have, I believe that the, the universal church of God must have values. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day. I, I won't mention names. I went to his office. And he's taken over, you know, a government department. And uh, he's the head of the government department. And I, I asked him, you know, how are things going with your department? Just about three, four days ago. And he said it was tough for me. Because all the values that they have set has been broken, has been destroyed. None of the people there, even the head of the department, was not adhering to the values that has been set. So he said, once I came into my position of being in that, I don't want to mention the name, in that position, he said, I have to go back to the values that has been set previously at the very foundation so that we can now rule and govern, you know, in a manner that is, that is of great integrity and honesty and sincerity. And I thought, how wonderful that is. You know, this is what we need in the church today. So we got a value of serving, empowering. We value the, 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 the supernatural. We value missions. And we also value being authentic, being sincere, non-hypocritical, hypocritical. So these are the values that I began to share. And I believe that this is something that is lacking in all the churches across the world where we don't have values. See, when we talk about the ground, as the Bible says, the sower goes and sows the seed to the ground. So what are your values? What values have you built in your life? What are the beliefs that you have which will dictate to you and to me the way we behave and live our Christian lives? If we want to see growth, if we want to see change, if we want to see the unsaved come into the life of the church, it is important then therefore we hold on to values. We hold on to beliefs and that our behavior must be like Christ-like in all that we do. Amen? Gone very quiet on me. I don't know about you, I think I'm preaching good. So, <laughs> you better join me. So, let's look at the, uh, the value of community. Value of community tells us we can be a church who by God's grace and love encourage and support one another and create a place where all who come can find a sense of belonging. The Bible says they shared. They shared everything with each other. You know, friends, we are all created for community, fashioned for fellowship, and formed by God for a family. We all. Romans chapter 12 verse 5 tells us, in the same way, we are many people, but in Christ, we are all one body. It doesn't matter whether it's the people's church. It doesn't matter whether it's Resto Community Church. It doesn't matter what church. But we are one body in Christ. We are the parts of that body. And each part belongs to all the others. Every one of us here this morning, sit under my voice. You belong to this local church, this local body. And you must have a sense of belonging. You must have a sense of ownership. You must have a sense of, of being accepted. This is what community is. You know that the business world is trying to form community in their places of business, but they can't because you know why? There is something very great within the body of Christ that can unite us and make us a community of people. It is nothing but the blood and the body and the presence of the Holy Ghost in the life of believers. Amen. That's what makes us community. That's what makes us accept, expect, accepting rather each and each another, each and every one of us together and we form what we call a family of God. We are put together, built together, members together, heirs together, fitted together and held together and we will be caught up one day together. Amen. I believe that we'll be caught up one day together. Therefore, we all have the right to belong and make others too belong in this community of God. The meaning of community is in the Bible comes from a Hebrew word called kahal, which is spelled Q-A-H-A-L. 
It is, it is used over 110 times in the Old Testament. Only once the word community is used in the New Testament. And this is what it means. It means assembly. It means congregation. It means a company of people. It means a company. And in the New Testament, it's only mentioned once. All the other times, you know what the, the community is called? It's called the church. The living body of Christ. The organism. It's not an organization. It is the people of God. All other times, all other times, you know, it is called community. Only once in the New Testament is called community, but all of the times it's called the church. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, On this rock I will build my church, my ecclesia. He said, I will build my church. I will build my people. I will build my congregation. I will build my company of people. I will build my chosen ones. I will, I will call them out. I will bring them in. And I will build them in. So we are a community of people. So, can we have an Acts 2, 42, 47 church? Like what the disciples, apostles had. I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can. I'm sure that we can build everything that God wants to build in our lives. And build the church. Because God wants us to know and he wants us to accept each other just the way we are. Do you do, do you do it very well? No, but we are a work in progress, isn't it? We are on a journey, all of us, and God is taking us through this. You know what we have done in our church, and I believe you've done it better here, I must say. We encourage people in our church to attend life groups. Do you call it life groups here too? Life groups. You know why? Because it's a big church. It's a large church, and you'll find it hard to, to have intimate fellowship, relationships with one another. What we have found out, and you too, and you do it so well, as I said, is that we all need each other. You know, we, we can't be a hermit. We can't, you know, uh, 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 serve God all by ourselves. God wants each and every one of us, if we really believe in this thing called community, then we must gather ourselves. We may not be able to connect with all, but life groups is one place where you can connect with. Learn to trust each other. So what we have done is we have started to encourage our church people, which, which early is a life group leader of our church, and we told them to go to life groups. And we see the difference in people who go to life groups and to those who don't go to life groups. We find that the people who go to life groups are spiritually well off or the spiritually growing and they're doing exciting things and they get their needs met in their life groups and they begin to trust one another. You know, the other day, one of our brothers in, I also attend a life group. I don't take a life group, I attend a life group. And in this life group, we had a couple of ladies and a couple of gents and they had issues in their lives. One was going through a family breakup, and that person was really struggling. Another one was sick. The other one was having difficulties in her office, and they were struggling. They made prayer that week. And after we prayed as a group, they came the next week, and the lady was completely healed of a situation that has been in her body for weeks, or not weeks, sorry, months and years. And the, and the lady was also completely delivered, and this, this other young man is beginning to work with his wife now and begin to see God do certain things. You know what the Lord told me? He said, miracles are going to take place in the life groups. God is going to use people in the group and, and, and work with them because there's a sense of trust and intimacy and a oneness that is taking place. So let me encourage you, if you want to be a part of a community, community, you may not be, be able to be a part of a large community, but a small community will enhance your life in every way. Amen? I hope that will encourage you to attend life group and never give up. You know, there are certain things that we all go through. You know, there are people struggling with all sorts of behavioral problems. Some of you as haven't still quit smoking. I quit smoking the day I got saved. Some of you still hit the bottle, I suppose, to drown your sorrows. Some of you go and watch porn on the, on the, on the net. You know, these things can happen to people. 
But if you have somebody that is close to you, somebody who will, who will partner with you, who will believe with you, and who will keep the trust and the confidence, you know, you can go to that person and say, hey, brother, can you please pray for me? I had a great, I had a great mentor in my life group while I was in Sri Lanka, Brother Christians. Oh, what a wonderful man of God. He would walk up to me and tell me stuff that I would want to hear from anyone else but him. And he, he, he really built me up. I was struggling with issues and difficulties. I was having a lot of struggles in my initial, you know, uh, conversion. Because God had to work in my life and clean me out. And here was Brother Christians praying for me. I would share anything with him. And he would keep it a secret. And he would say, Brother, I'll pray for you. The Lord will set you free. And true, God set me free. Is the Bible saying, no, the truth, the truth will set you free? And whom the Son sets you free is free indeed. John 8, 8, 32, John 8, 36. That is very true. My friends, we can't travel this journey all by ourselves. We need a community of believers. We need the church. We need one another. And if you are serious in growing, if you are serious in bearing fruit, if you are serious in seeing the covenant of God kept in your life, I want to encourage you then, therefore, be a part of the community of believers. Psalm 68 verse 6 says, God sets the lonely in families. How good that is. Some of you have been lonely for a long time. And God has brought you into the family of God. Because he has brought you. Just join and click in and find your nick and start to, you know, grow as a family in God. That was in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47 church. It was happening then. You think it can't happen now? It is happening to an extent, but God wants it to happen more and more, and God is doing something marvelous. Let's look at the other one, serving. Serving. We can be a church who will intentionally demonstrate God's love for all people through intentional acts of mercy. And compassion. That's what serving is. Among everything that the Bible calls us friends. The Bible calls us children of God. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. The Bible calls us, calls us a family of God. The sons and daughters of God. We all love to be called the sons of God. And we pride all that word. We are sons of God. So we are sons. So we are not illeg illegitimate. We are legitimate children of God. And we pride over that. We are all priests. We are people of God, saints of God, friends of God. But in his word, there is one important reference that God repeatedly makes of his leaders and his disciples. And he calls them servants of God. Every one of us are here this morning to serve God and to serve one another. I'm serving you right now as I am I'm preaching to you. This is, the, this is the job that God's called me to do. So I want to serve with all diligence. So we are here to serve one another, whatever capacity, with whatever gifts God's given you. He wants you and I to serve him. Serving God is so important. Genesis chapter 18, verse 3. Abraham, though known as a friend of God, the Bible says, If I found favor, Abraham tells the Lord, In you, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. What's your attitude this morning? Is your attitude of that one of a servant? Or is your attitude of one that wants to be served? Jesus himself never came to be served. He came to serve. The Acts 2, 42, 40 to 47 church was a servant's church. It was a church that served the people. The apostles served the people. And everyone involved in that church was serving. Job 42 verse 8 says, God refers to Job. God referring to Job, he says, my servant Job will pray for you. You remember his three friends that came to him and said all manner of things. And God had to, had to intervene and he got, he got his servant to pray for these three friends of his. You see, God wants us to be servants all the time. We are doing a, we are doing a, a study on servanthood. And uh, somebody said this very, very... Uh, Gently, he said, you know, if uh, you are asked to do something by somebody else in the church, even to wash the toilets, how would you feel as a pastor to do it? Well, I said, I do it all the time anyway. 
I clean the toilets if I have to. I, I, I'll do anything. You ask Errol, Errol is seated here, he'll tell you. I do all that stuff. You know, when you are a servant, you don't care who tells you what to do. You know, we, if we try to move from servant to do something else, you know, then we are going to get into trouble. But we must always remember, Jesus is the greatest servant. When he came, he said, I have come to serve you. And the Bible says the greatest act of servanthood was shown by Jesus when he got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. And you know how menial that was then in that time, in that culture? But Jesus did that to show us as an example. He said the greatest among you will be the servant of all. The greatest, greatest among you. But we think that the greatest among you must drive the best car, have the best job, walk into the church, you know, not bothered about those around you. You know, this is not the style of, 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 of the Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47 church. No, it was a servants driven church. The church must be a movement of servants, a movement of servants. It must be serving the Lord and his people. We must be known for the way we serve people. And we must be devoted. And I'm here today, this morning, devoted to serve you. To be devoted means we must be concerned, mindful, and come alongside one another in our service to the Lord. That's what it means. To be mindful, to be concerned, to come alongside people, and to serve one another. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says, carry each other's burdens. Carry. So we have to carry. You know, my wife tells me, uh, you're thinking a little bit too much of this, this situation. I said, no, honey, I'm, I'm, I'm carrying this situation. I want to see a breakthrough in the life of that person. You know, the grace that's upon my life. I said, I want to see it operating in that person's life so that person will have a breakthrough, that the family situation will, 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 will be re resolved and the healing will take place. See, we must take this on. Sometimes we come to church, we worship God, we praise Him, we give off our tithes, we give off our offerings, and we go. We think we're done of a spiritual little, you know, uh, uh, job. No, God wants us to carry one another's burdens. Has the church lost that? That serving, that serving privilege and attitude that God wants each and every one of us to have. We must be serving not only in the life of the church, we must be serving when we go to our jobs. I had a young girl who came to me the other day and he said, you know, pastor, I really don't like to go to work. I said, why? She said, I just go do my job and come back. I said, you're not going to, church, to work to do your job. We, are not, we don't do jobs in the ministry, in, 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 in the life of the body of Christ. We are serving servants. Wherever we go, whether it will be in your place of work, in your home, your business, wherever you are, you must learn that I'm going there to serve him and serve one another. With that attitude, you will be motivated. You have a great, a great zeal and enthusiasm and a compassion. And you'll want to go because why? You know whom you're serving when you go to your place of work. Amen? Amen. That's how I live my life and that's how I want to live my life as a servant. Romans 12, 10 says, Be devoted to one another with authentic, Brotherly affection. That's what the Bible says. So this is the greatest demonstration of mercy. The greatest demonstration of compassion. By carrying one another's burden. And our third value. Our third value is empowering. We are here to empower each other. We can be investing ourselves. And our resources to equip. Develop. And empower others to reach, to reach their, their God-given purposes on earth. So the church is here to empower one another. To reach their God-given destiny. You know when Pastor Coulter gets up here and all the other pastors when they get up here and preach. They empower us, don't they? They empower us to reach our destiny. So God has a destiny for every single person in this congregation. He's got a purpose. 
The only way that we can reach our destiny, the only way that we can fulfill the purpose that God has for us is because we belong in the life of a church serving and as we belong and serve, we empower one another. Every time the word of God is preached from this pulpit, every time you read the word in your devotions, Every time somebody else will come and say, you know, I want you to believe God has given me a word for you and you prophesy, you are empowering them. You know, we have a lady in our church. Uh, she lost her husband for cancer many, many years ago. And uh, very lately, a lady came to her and uh, began to say, you know, uh, I just lost my husband. And she was going through grief. And this lady was able to empower her. By sharing with her what she had gone through. God uses every bit of our experiences in life. It doesn't matter where you have been. It doesn't matter what you have gone through. In this journey of life, God will use everything that you have been through. Whether it's been lost, whether it's been lost in finances, loss of a family member, a spouse. Even if your family has broken up. I want to say something to you this morning. God never gives up on us. He will use every situation. He'll use you to empower others to go forward in life. Amen. I believe that with all of my heart that this is the intention and plan of God to use everything that we go through. We sometimes may be overcome by fear, low self-esteem. We go through temptations, trials, tests, tribulations, and troubles. Who doesn't go through this stuff? We all go through this stuff. But we are here to empower each other. Hey, come on, we can do it. Let's, let's believe God together. God will give you a word in season for you to share. Friends, this is how we're going to make it. This is how the Acts 2 church, you know, lived their lives. They were empowering, empowering each other and going forward because the disciples, they would get up there and they would preach the word. As the Bible says, the apostles kept preaching and teaching. Why were they preaching and why were they teaching? And the process was to empower people to become what God has called them to be in life. I will never ever allow myself, you know, to be the way I am. I have many people who empower me. I have close friends who empower me, who teach me, who help me. And you know, the whole time we need to be empowered because the more we are empowered, the more we will see the goal. I want to go to my promised land before I die. How about you? Do you want to go to your promised land to fulfill the purpose of God for your life? So get behind somebody. And ask that person and you together, empower them to go forward. You know, the most important thing I have found as how I empower myself is with the word of God. You know, I'll tell you something. 90% of Christians today don't even read the Bible. It is sad. People, they just live on their own emotiveness. How they feel, in other words. But God wants us to live in his word. The less of the word of God that you have, the less of the spiritual vision that you will have. The less of the word of God, the less of the power of God in your life. The less of the word of God, the less of the knowledge to completely destroy the devil's attacks on your life. The less of the word of God, the less you will live an overcoming life. The less of the word of God, the less success and prosperity in your life. The less of the word of God in your life, the less of the presence of God in your life. One way of empowering yourself is getting into the word of God. Getting hold of the Bible. And really studying it, reading it, meditating on it, memorizing it, confessing it. You know, these things are very, very important and vital. It's not just for the pastors to stand up and declare the word of God. It is for all of us. That's exactly what Acts 2, 42 to 47, you know, what the people of God did at that time. And can we be an Acts 2 church? We can be an Acts 2 church. Because God didn't put it there for nothing. He put it there for us to see and tell ourselves we can be what God has called us to be. So let's look at the rivers of this. 
The more of the word of God that you have, the more of the spiritual vision that you have. The more of the word of God, the more of the power of God in your life. If you're lacking power this morning, God's power in your life, put the word of God into your life. The more of, God, more of the word of God, the more of the knowledge to completely destroy the devil's attacks on your life. And I always tell myself when I have an attack on my life by the enemy, I tell myself I know the word of God. And I tell the devil these things. I tell the devil, you know that I know that I know that you know that I know. So it's a problem. I tell the devil that. You know that I know. I know that you know. You know that I know that I know that you know. What the word of God. You see, when you go against the enemy with the word of God, he has to back off. So we can empower each other with the word of God, by the word of God, in the word of God. If we take the word of God seriously for our lives and live the word of God out, you and I will be able to help every single person that comes across our path. Amen? The fifth one is supernatural. Oh, fourth one, sorry. I'm running short of time. We can depend on the presence of the Holy Spirit and therefore hunger for a life that is intimate with God and contends for the miraculous. I don't have to say much about the miraculous in this church because this is a miracle itself. When you are living and, and breathing and worshipping and praising God in a miracle, what do you think you can expect? Miracles. I tell the, my church the same thing. I said, this is a miracle, this, this facility. And I said, if God provided the miracle, God will provide everything for you and me. You know, just the other day I was, uh, I tell our church, we, we, of course I shared quite a lot, a couple of Sundays on this miracle supernatural living. One day I had a fall in my front yard and uh, I uh, tripped on the horse, watering horse, and uh, I fell on my back, you know. So as a rugger player, you think it's nothing, you just get up and go. But uh, as you grow older, it's a little bit different. So I looked around, there was no neighbors looking, so I knew I was not embarrassed. So I quietly walked in and, you know, tried to nurse my injury. So I struggled with it and I was just telling the Lord, I said, Lord, I want you to heal me. You know, I had a revelation of what God told me that morning, that night rather. This is what he said to me. He said, son, I waited 4,000 years to send my son, Jesus Christ, into this world. 4,000 years, I was sick and tired, more or less, to see the devil create problems and difficulties and havoc on the lives of my people. So I sent him 2,000 years ago. So that you and I, you could be healed. And at that very moment, sitting on my prayer chair at home, the power of God hit me and I was completely set free just a few months ago. You know, we have to tap into the supernatural. The supernatural is for all of us. The church, the Acts 2 church, they lived in the supernatural. And for us, the supernatural is normal. It's a normal lifestyle for the believer to live in the supernatural. Jesus said this verse, I have come to give you life and this life more abundantly. The supernatural is connected to the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to give us. So let me encourage you, you know, First and foremost, whatever you are going through, go to the Lord first and say, Lord, I want you to undertake for this. I want the supernatural power of God to flow into this situation. We have people in our church that was diagnosed with cancer. Four of them. And all four today are seated in the life of the church. Errol knows the four of them. Completely set free from cancer. Completely set free from cancer. Because why? They believed in the supernatural. Not just only in the healing, but in their jobs, in their, in their families, in situations that, that, that no one can give or bring an answer. The supernatural power of God flowed into every situation. And God is a God of the supernatural. Amen? Amen. And fifthly, we got a call for missions. We can make Jesus known to our world through the power of the gospel. And therefore, we will, will not allow passivity, 
unbelief, religion, or any other barrier to hinder us in this pursuit. This is what the church is here for. The church is here to reach the lost. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21 tells us that God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. Everyone here this morning, my friends, listen to me. This is the greatest thing in all of our lives. We are saved. We are born again. Filled in the Holy Ghost. It's now for the church to reach out to the lost. That's the supreme purpose. Why we are here. We are here to reach the lost. He tells us in Isaiah 6, 18. Sorry, Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me, send me. You know what that means to me? There is a 24-7 missions call from heaven. God is calling out to the church and saying, who will go? Amy McPherson, the founder of the Foursquare Gospel Church, she heard this from the word of God and she said, send me Lord, I will go, I will go. God is saying to each and every one of us this morning, who will go? Who will go and reach the lost? Who will go as missionaries? Who will go into their places of work? If you will only answer the call and say, God, send me, I will go. There's a missionary call from heaven to all of us here this morning. Because God is interested in the unsaved. And he wants us to reach out to them. Luke chapter 16, verses 27 and 28 says, And he answered, and, and then, uh, he answered then, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus, which means God has help, to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not allow, allow come to this place of torment. There's also a missionary's call from hell. Not only there's a missionary, missionary's call from heaven, but there's a missionary call from hell. Your unsaved friends, I hope there's no unsaved families who have died before. I believe that God is merciful and gracious. But your unsaved friends that never heard the gospel from you, even though when you were with them, you didn't tell them about Jesus. But you know, today they would probably have ended up in hell. I don't, I don't condemn and send anybody to hell. But what I'm saying is, if they have rejected the gospel or they never heard about God, never knew what it is, they've gone down to hell. You know what? They're crying out from hell. And saying, send someone to my mother's home or my father's or brother's home. Because I don't want my relatives or my relatives to come where I am. My friends, if we look at hell, if we have a vision of hell, people down there in that bottomless pit today, who is, who is crying out and saying, don't send people here. Don't send people here. Because they know they can never change or alter the course once they're gone. And God wants us, therefore, to arise. And go, there's also a missionary's call from earth, which tells us here very, very clearly that God wants us. The, 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 the world is waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. I think, the, I think there's a big difference between Christians and the sons of God today. I believe the sons of God are the ones that they're referring to who are walking with God, walking in the anointing in the power of God. And today we have Christians so-called under the banner of Christianity but they're not walking with God. The world is not waiting to see a Christian. The world is waiting to see the, the sons of God manifest. There's a missionary call from heaven. There's a missionary call from hell. And there's also a missionary call from this earth. Who will go? Send me, Lord. I will go. And finally, I'm running short of time. The last one is such an important one. And it's about, it's about authenticity. It's about sincerity. It's about being non-hypocritical. Let me say this. We can be a church. We can be a church, friends. We're referring to the Acts 2 church. Who in response to his amazing grace are not ashamed to pursue authentic lives that honor the word of God and influence our world. This is the most important value that I hold to. To be authentic. To be, to be sincere, to be, to be non-hypocritical. It's like when you walk into your wardrobe, you find that bar that holds all your clothes on. 
If that bar, if that bar collapses, all your clothes will fall. If the bar, the value of authenticity and sincerity falls down in your life, every other value that we have spoken this morning will also crumple and fall down. Today we have the church who are the more, I, I'm sorry to say this, but this is a reality and a fact. I have found more liars in the church than outside. Such liars, cheats, you know, they, are, they, 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 they say all manner of things. They never keep their word, Pastor, I'll see you tomorrow. But tomorrow comes, they never see them. I know of people that will stay in their home and they will get a call from the debtors and they will say, oh, he's not at home now, but he's sitting on the lounge there, but they lie. My friends, we must stop this. This is not of God. If we want to see the increase, if we want to see fruitfulness, if we want to see a move of God like the first century church had, then we better get authentic, we better become sincere, and we better, better, better become non-hypocrites. This is an important thing. He's not coming for a dirty, filthy rag. He's coming for a blood-bought, blood wash, a church without a spot or a wrinkle. He's purifying the church. He's making the church clean today, young people. I'm sorry to say, there are people that had left our church, not many, but because they couldn't stand and want to be holy, they left the church, they went and moved on to live with their girlfriend and live in fornication. Enough of adulteries. Enough of all this. There's a man called Joseph Levi. He was Barnabas in the Bible. He sold a big property and brought and gave the money to the church. An honorable man. He did what he wanted to do before the Lord. Chapter 4, book of Acts. Chapter 5, a book of Acts. Just the next chapter. There was two more, Ananias and Sapphira. They sold, but they were dishonest before God. God doesn't want dishonesty in our lives. He wants us to stop our lying. Stop our cheating. Stop our trying to get ourselves into a place, getting into debt, getting into situations that you know that you can't pay. And God wants us to walk in freedom and liberty. If you say where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and liberty. Let that freedom and liberty flow out of our lives and let the Lord guide and lead us into all things, church. Because if we don't, we can't be that Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Amen. Amen. Can we stand? My time is out. I think I've gone over by five minutes. Sorry, Paul. Can we stand this morning, church? <clears throat> Let me encourage you this morning. Thank you so much for listening. But I really believe that there's a shift coming in our lives. There's a move of God that is being prepared to come upon us across the world because the coming of the Lord is near. And I believe the God, that God wants the church to get ready. Are you one of those people who say, God, I want to be ready. I want to be a part of this community. I want to be a part of these servants of this great body of Christ. I want to live in the supernatural. I want to be a man who will reach out to the lost. I want to be a person who will empower others. I want to be a man of honesty, sincerity. You know what a lot of people talk about us? I don't want to go to that church because there are so much of hypocrites. You know, we don't need to have to hear that. That's not our reputation. That was not the reputation of the church then there. You know what? The Bible says that God kept adding and people feared the church because these people were holy. They were God lovers. And they wanted to do everything to please God. How about you this morning? What sort of commitment do you want to have? What sort of commitment do you want to give? The church needs to hear this message over and over again because we can fall into a place of real passivity, lethargy, unbelief, and laziness. So let me pray with you this morning, church. I want you to just look to the Lord, talk to the Lord in these areas where you have not committed yourself. Tell the Lord that you want to be a part of it. Many of you are probably in it. But there is more, a shift coming for more in your life. As you said, I want to increase, increase. And he wants to give the increase. Father, I thank you this morning for this privilege I have to share with these wonderful people, such godly men and women who are here today, seeking and looking to you, Lord, to fulfill the purpose for not just only for this church, but for this nation. And I pray this morning, Lord, for your anointing and your blessings upon their lives. 
as they commit themselves, Lord, to, to seek you and to fulfill the vision and the dreams you've given them. I pray for your grace now to come upon each and every one of them. Heal the sick, heal the brokenhearted today. Set the captives free, Lord, under this anointing. Let your spirit have his will and way in their lives. Draw them unto you, Lord. Let them see your glory, Father. Even as Moses saw all the provision of yours, even as Moses saw the dividing of the Red Sea, even as you spoke with him face to face, he was not content. He wanted to see your glory. So Lord, everyone here this morning, let them never be content with where they are, but them, let them seek you that they might know you and your glory. Bless them, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for listening, church.